Hmm. I decided to jump in one minute early. What do you think? Am I justified in doing so? Uh, hopefully. I see Beckett. T. Um, Frank the Tank. Space Monkey. Shuki. Formal Top Hat. Newt Scamander. Crockett Henderson. Hair Wade. Supreme Gecko. The Bug Hub. Cloud 9.5. Excellent. Muffin Man. Zero Cool. Welcome, everybody. I thought we'd start out by checking on these guys. Oh, the J-Man's in the house. Thoropod, too. These are my Armadillidium Clue Guy Dubrovnik Red Face. Just going to take a peek, see how they're doing. Edison, hello. Endemic Storm. Oh, take a look. How are they looking? I'm hoping to see some juveniles soon in here. Ah, the Mad Aquarist is here too. Nice. Let's see, what do we got? Lots of springtails going on. Springtail action. There's a fungus net. And I'm just going to move some moss for a second, see what I see. More springtails. So. I don't see any babies yet, but not a big deal. People have said in other streams that uh, these guys often take a while, and that's cool. I got them in October, beginning of October, I think. So, uh, let's see. Tip Top Taylor, Arthropod and Bassiners. Cool, yeah. These are a cool morph. I have Dubrovnik Red Phase, and I also have Armadillidium, Armadillidium Klugai Montenegro, both of them. But these are a much more recent uh, acquisition. The other ones I've had for a few years now, and they're breeding like crazy. But um, So let's see. Porcelio Hoffman Zegai. We're going to check out at least one of the Porcelio Hoffman Zegai colonies today. Um, what, what day of the week is it? I think it's a Monday. No, it's a Tuesday. So Cloud 9.5. I keep my Klugais really dry, except for they have a moist area with the moss hydration station. The rest of this is like pretty much bone dry. So that's how I do it and it seems to work pretty well. Cause yeah, I agree, they like it dry and they have a lot of ventilation. As you can see here, this one is pretty well vented and it's got vent on the, vents on the sides too for cross ventilation. So yeah, I agree, totally agree with you there. Um, so let's see. So arthropod ambassadors, let me move these guys in and put something else down and we'll, we'll chat. I just moved my gestroy, I mean I just replaced half the substrate, my gestroy, and it kind of upset the way they hung out because there used to be a ton under here and now there are still a lot but they've kind of moved around a bit. So let's see. So Arthropod Ambassadors Awesome Podcast with Richard last week on the Exotic Pet Collective. Very fun listen. Thank you. I really enjoyed talking to Richard. He's a fun guy to talk to. He's got a lot of cool stuff going on. And it was really fun to chat isopods and other bioactive critters. So, um, so Chris, the Mad Aquarist, Biggs. Cubara species that I work with. Only two. I'm, uh, I've only got rubber duckies and red tigers at this point. That may change it at some point, but because I don't have a permit to sell Cubaris, I'm kind of, I'm not pursuing like getting any new species until that changes. So that's kind of what I'm doing there. Oh yes, Arthropod Ambassadors, you're right. It, they were the Hoffs, the Hoffman's Egg because we talked about it at some point, whether that was on the podcast or a different point. So Masked Parakeet, what should I feed isopods other than substrate? Well, you've got a lot of options, um, but... Substrate should be a main component of their food for many species, but I like to use fish food pellets. I like to use vegetables. Uh, any kind of squash or zucchini is good. Green beans. Um, bits of most types of fruit, like apple, banana, all work. Carrots are good. 
Um, and for protein sources other than fish food, there are a lot of isopod diets out there. You can also use dried crustaceans. <coughs> Excuse me. Dried crustaceans or dried insects like dried mealworms work. Uh, dried uh, crickets, dried river shrimp. If you want to use a crustacean, they work well. Uh, you can feed them the dried minnows that are sold for use as isopod food work really well. There's a lot of a lot of different options you've got. So hopefully that helps. Um, okay, let's see. King of Sorrow, hello. Rarest isopod in the hobby or in the wild, Muffin Man? Possibly Pseudorella atlantica, the uh, species that is limited in its native distribution exclusively to the island of St. Helena. And in just certain areas of that particular island where a certain kind of, I think it's called a black cabbage tree grows and it feeds upon the spores of a fern that grows in that tree. Uh, black cabbage tree fern, I think is what it is, something like that. And it, it feeds upon the spores of that fern and it also feeds upon pollen from other plants and very rare. So it could be possibly the rarest. Certainly very limited in distribution. All those that are playing at home, take a drink. Good idea. I, I should have brought my water bottle in here or I would be doing that. Oh, cloud 9.5 running out of leaves. Uh oh. Well, if, you, if you're in the U.S., I can't remember if you are, but if you're in the U.S., let me know. I can ship them now. I can ship leaf litter. So I'm excited about that. Mm. Okay. Let's take a look at the California mix, Porcelio Levis. Really liking this uh, mix. Ooh, got a little bit of mold going in there. It is a new colony, but it's not too bad. And. Could you use the scrimp from your aquarium for your isopods to feed them? They'd probably eat them. I don't know how, you know, you'd feel about that otherwise, but... Oh, look at their babies. Lots of babies in there. Let's, let's pull this up and see what we see. Yep. Lots of babies down in the substrate. You notice I'm not using the term monkai because apparently that only applies to the first instar, and these are definitely not first instar. Ooh, lots of babies on there too. Check it out. This colony is really starting to go to town and produce well for me. I'm, I'm excited about it. I really like this. Uh <coughs> Excuse me. I guess it's a morph. Um, it's kind of a, it's a polymorphic morph. Very fun that there's so many colors, even though genetically it's not a mix. They're just genetically from one stock, but they're doing well. Um, See, catching up. Tip Top Taylor says, How many isopods do you need a container and they'll become more visible in the enclosure? Kidnap some Armadillidium vulgari from under a pot and see maybe one a day, even under the quick mark. Well, uh, that will depend on the size of the enclosure as well as the species and whatnot. Armadillidium vulgari is not the absolutely most active species, but you will see them more as the uh, population increases. When you double or triple that population, I guarantee you'll see them more. Uh, you'll see them more. So, that, that will help. But it might be a while. I mean, there is an acclimation period, especially with the wild ones. I feel like the wild ones take longer, to be honest. Um, okay, so Wally, this is a great question. For your food rotation, do you go through a very routine schedule or do you select a food randomly? Usually kind of random. Uh, it's, yeah, I don't think I have a think about it like uh, which one I'm doing kind of keep it random are dairy cows good isopods good starters yes Jackson they are a great starter as long as you are prepared to deal with the fact that they will reproduce like crazy because some people are not uh, prepared to deal with that so if you're not then they're not a great starter but if if you're fine with that then go ahead they're great um, all right so moving some isopods And I do, uh, let's see, hello Crystals Pets and Plants, 
So Space Monkey, how often should you change the soil for a new isopod colony? Um, if it's new, you probably don't need to change it for a number of months at least. Uh, probably three to six, depending on the culture, maybe even longer, depending on how deep the substrate is, how many you have, and so on. Um, so yeah, you, I wouldn't worry about it while they're new. So Crockett Henderson's getting baby, baby Porcelio dilatatus. Awesome. How long it takes different isopod species to become sexually mature? Hmm, okay. Well, a lot of species take, uh, it's usually until they're about one third of adult size, um, something like that. And some species take all the way until they're almost fully adults. These are Porcelio Hoffman's egg eye black. Got these from Finger Lakes feeders. They're doing really well. But I don't think they have started reproducing yet. They're fairly young and small still. For, for They're not small, but they're small for their own species. So that looks a little moldy. I'm going to have to fix that. But uh, yeah, they're looking, looking good. I haven't noticed any mortality with these guys. Uh, they're doing well. You can see, I don't know if you can tell, but this is frass, almost entirely frass under here. They're the shape of isopod frass, kind of the flat rectangle shape that you see. So they've been eating a lot, obviously, as well. So really doing well. The Porcelio Hoffman's egg-eyed black. Love the colors on these. The really narrow white borders and the dark, dark coloration, which I think gets even darker as they get older. So very cool locality. Not a morph per se. It's a locality that's collected like this. Um, so these are, these are baby Hoffman's egg-eyed. These are not adults. So um, they will grow a lot bigger. Um, than these. So, mm, okay. So about a third of the body size for many. Um, Porcelio dilatatus will be produced at about a third of their body size. Size. Albatross king. Red bud seems to work. Can you use live moss instead of what you use? Armadillidium vulgari. You probably could. I like to use the sphagnum moss partly because it is safe. I know what's going in there, just wet sphagnum moss and not other pests or parasites or whatever. Um, young lad, welcome. Can you keep isopods and smaller millipedes together? You can. It may not necessarily be the best course of action, but it is possible to do it. It can cause issues uh, when, if you want them both to be reproducing well, it's probably not the best idea, but it can be done. Oh, Albatross Gaming. So you have, you can collect the wild California mix. That's awesome. Okay. We're going to take a look at the Orange Dalmatian um, Magic Potion here. Armadillidium vulgari, wild Armadillidium vulgari, wild Porcelia lavis, much more active. Haven't done much with my wild Porcelia lavis, but I'd put my money on the uh, the Porcelia lavis being more active just because the my experience with that species in general. Oh, I saw one. Where, where's it going? It's hiding. Uh, my experience with that species in general has been that way. Oh, there's a nice one. Nice big one. Look at that. Let's, let's watch that one open and crawl around. That'd be cool, I think. Um, Orange Dalmatian Magic Potion, this one here. And, um, okay, so Newt, what do you mean with no leaves? I must have missed something. Let me know what you mean. I'm happy to, to talk about that. Um, and the, the dried leaves, yeah, I've got some pretty good dried leaves. I've got some nice magnolia here. Mast parakeet, if you have a yard where you know that pesticides are not causing problems, you can certainly collect them. You know, I don't spray it in my trees at all, or my grass, so I am pretty safe using mine. If, if you think you're safe that way, you're probably good. Okay, so everybody, I am going to start covering some Patreon questions. Here we go. Um, Critters and More says, I have a mite issue, and I'm not sure how best to deal with it. Why is that not focusing? Hmm try to get that to focus. We, Id we identified them to the best of our ability and they appear to be predatory mites. They don't seem to be affecting the isopods themselves, even the dwarf whites and purples, but they do 
take down springtails. I restarted my springtail cultures, but I'm unsure if I should be seeding my enclosures with springtails while the mites are present. I typically add more springtails once a month to all my isopod and dart frog enclosures. I've set up all my newer isopod cultures away from my one with mites, and I'm trying everything I can to keep them from spreading. I have chiffon over all the vents, but since the sterilite lids aren't tight, I think they go under the lid. I also have all of my bins on diatomaceous earth, and the new bins I have wrapped with scorpion barrier tape, which is very similar to the hanging fly tape. This seems to help, but hasn't gotten rid of the mites already present. My main concern would be trading or selling isopods to someone and having these hitchhike with them. Do you foresee any other issues with this? The groups I'm in online have mixed feelings, and a lot of people seem to want them to help with fungus gnats, and they have. If you have any recommendations, I would love to hear. Maybe you could cover this question in a live stream. I know others have raised the question, and it's hard to find a lot of information on them. Thanks for taking the time to read this. Okay, so Critters More, let's talk about that for a minute. I, my inclination, first of all, about seeding your enclosures with the springtails when the mites are present, if you're doing that monthly and you have nice, robust springtail cultures, go ahead. And, and redo that, I mean, and do that, unless you really want the mites to go extinct and then you could try starving them out sort of by not having any springtails in there. But my inclination would be to put them in. The mites will probably keep eating some of the springtails, but I don't think they'll completely cause their extinction. I have not had enclosures where they do cause their complete extinction. I have had predatory mites in some of my enclosures, but my experience has been in general that they do not completely eradicate the springtails uh, in most cases, and everything hits a balance eventually. I, I need to get enough springtails in there so that they can keep going. Um, the predatory mites help keep the other mites out. They do help with fungus nets, like you're saying. And I wouldn't be too concerned about it, honestly, because it's hard to prevent them from getting places. I think what you're doing, that could help. Oh, we lost our little buddy there, didn't we? There it is. One more time. We'll, we're going to watch you walk, walk around while I talk. Oh, no, nope, it's rolling off. Let's get another bin. So I would say I haven't been overly concerned with them. And you can always communicate. Uh, well, let me, let me put it this way. I don't think there are plenty of people who have isopods with uh, predatory mites who probably don't even know that they do. And so... I wouldn't worry about it too much. That's, that's my, um, that's, that's my two cents worth. I don't think it, they're as big of an issue as some people think they are. Um, okay, so we're going to turn this over, take a look at some of my Porcelli expenses. That's a nice one. Starting to put on some size, huh? And a little one too. There's quite a few in here. So excited when I look in here. There's usually quite a lot. See, there's a ton right there. Love these guys. Okay, I'm going to go through the post for a couple more Patreon questions because we have more. Um, we have a comment from Jose Avila says, Russ, what do you think about feeding store-bought mushrooms to ice pods? I have done it. I think when I've done it, they're organic, and I really, really wash them off really well first, and I would recommend doing that whether you're using organic or not. Wash them off really well first, but I have done it and it didn't seem to cause any problems. In fact, I think they did really well. So I'm totally having trouble focusing today, but um, yeah, I, I, I think that's fine. Cub Xavier says, I've got a couple of mite questions. The mites I've had issues with have been white and when touched or squished, they have an odd chemically chemical or fruity sweet scent. I've been keeping them at bay by putting food in and taking it out when their mites are clumped on it. Any other tips or what kind they might be? Those sound like grain mites to me. I haven't necessarily noticed the chemical or fruity scent with them, but the fact that they are clumping up on the food sounds a lot like grain mites. Um, doing what you're doing can help, and it, I'm assuming you already have springtails in there, and that's going to help too, of course. So, yeah, I think you're on the right track there. And they probably are the grain mites. And so, once again, they're not as big of a deal as they can be in some situations. One thing that um, Oren McMonagle mentions in, in his book, Isopod Zoology, which I highly recommend, is that even when mites, uh, that kind of mite, grain mites, are in an isopod enclosure, they rarely get to the point where they're just covering everything and causing huge problems. So he gets into a lot more detail about how that works and about the different stages of mites and so on, and I'm not going to get into that necessarily, but um, basically, 
they can exist in isopodic cultures, but they seem to coexist to a large extent with the isopods. They'll overcrowd springtails. They'll outcompete springtails. But if isopods are in the enclosure, they don't seem to get to that point, which is cool. So I would say um, if you got springtails in there, just don't overfeed the isopods and the population of isopods should eventually get to the point where they're taking care of a lot of those. I just got to look at this one again one more time. Uh, springtails. The, they'll take over the, the mites and outcompete them to a large extent. Hopefully that helps. And I think those are all of our Patreon questions so far. Yep, looks like it. So back to the chat. Trying to catch up. Oh, yeah, you're right, Newt. There were no fancy leaves underneath. That's true. Just the white stuff. Um, yep, and Chris, I agree. Springtails are the best friends when dealing with the mold, and that is what I do. Um, I use springtails, and they really help. Um, I try not to put food down on wet substrate. Don't put food on the moss. Put food on dry substrate, or even better, put it on leaves or put it on... Uh, cork bark and, th and that helps keep the mold down as well keep the food down to a minimum uh, while the culture is young keep uh, it to a quantity the ice pods can eat quickly and that will help with the mold so I totally agree with what uh, Chris the Metaquarius just said and space monkey powder blue colony they want some decent ventilation so a lot of times what I do and I apologize this lid is not the easiest to see but I have two this has got chiffon and screen um, two holes like that. I've used that with uh, the powder blues in a six quart bin. I've used other schemes of ventilation. It all seems to work. Just be on the side of making sure they have enough. And that seems to help. We're going to take a look at the, the BC maples that I also got from Finger Lake Feeders. Um, and Muffin Man... Oh, wait, no, I'm lost. Okay. If you have springtails in your ice pod box with air holes, will they escape through them? If they do, and they might, uh-oh, that needs to be removed. That is way too much mold in there because that's a piece of food that has got moldy. Got to take that out. I mean, that's what you got to watch for. If it gets like that, ice pods can get entangled in it. A little bit like that, I'm not too worried about, but a piece like that definitely needs to be dealt with. So let's check and see what we got going on here. This is a new colony. So that is the uh, sole representative that wants to show up today of my BC Maples Oniscus ocellus. Oh, look, look, a juvenile. I said sole representative and it heard me. So awesome. That means I've got some young ones in there. And that one does not look as if it were just born. That's probably a few weeks old. So that's exciting. That means I'm sure I've got more of them in here. There's another piece of uneaten apple, I think, is that. I'm going to remove that. Um, and just take a wee peek and see what I can see. Sometimes it's fun to just look under the, the moss or even the, the area where the moss and the leaves mix. And you can see a lot of juveniles there sometimes. And I'm not seeing a lot of anything going on. But I saw evidence that they're reproducing. So I'm happy. Happy with that. Um... Okay, so Zach Wallace, question about the use of kettle bone. Do you simply place the kettle bone pieces in the enclosure or do you grind it up? Yep, like Frank Dedink says, you can do both. I have done both. Um, they will graze on it if it's just in a chunk and that seems to work fine, but if you want to grind it up a little bit, you can. Probably doesn't matter a whole lot. Let's see if my T-negative albinos are doing okay over here as we uh, go for the other questions. Mm. So Brian Orr, Porcellio spinicornis. That is a species I have not kept at all. So I, I don't feel qualified to give you a whole lot of information on that species. Um, I've read about it a little bit. It's, I'm just going to poke around a little. Oh, I see one. You know... A lot of albino animals, to me, don't look as cool as some of the other morphs, but I like these. They're pretty cool. They remind me of, like, butter or something. 
So Heather, yeah, I don't have any babies from the Dubrovniks, at least not that I've noticed. Just checked on them a minute ago. Did not see any babies. I guess that doesn't prove they're not there, but I didn't see any. And um, I didn't actually get any marbleized, so I haven't seen any babies of those either because I don't have them. But um, yeah, no babies yet. Hopefully it happens soon. Hello, Rodolfo. Albatross Gaming. Do you know any snakes that don't eat rodents? Yeah, yeah. The only snake that lives in Hawaii that is established in Hawaii is the flower pot snake and they mostly eat things like ants and termites isopods that kind of stuff they're far too small to eat rodents even pinkies uh, the snakes themselves are full grown at about six to eight inches long something like that uh, so yeah there's one um, decays brown snakes another good option for uh, snakes that don't eat rodents um, there are some insect Divores among the snakes as well. Um, rough green snakes and smooth green snakes tend to eat insects in preference to rodents. Um, garter snakes don't necessarily have to eat rodents. I feed mine rodents, but uh, you can give them a balanced diet without rodents if you're careful. If you give them things like amphibians and fish, thiaminase free fish, and uh, you give them worms with calcium supplements and so on, you can get by without doing rodents. Of course, there's the egg eating snakes. And there are others as well. So D'Angelo Hurtado, you have some orange ice pods, some brown little bugs came out which look like mites. When do you think they'll reproduce? Had them for three weeks. So depending on your species of ice pod, there's some fungus nets right there, check that out. Um, depending on the species you have, it could be, well, and just, just depending on their age and what, whatever, you could have babies anytime, seriously. Totally could. Um, but I would say that if they're adults, within a couple of months is not unreasonable to expect some babies. What do we got here? This is the Armadillidium vulgari gem mix. Very excited about these. Love the gem mix. I'm just going to see if we can see anybody. There's somebody. This is an, a wild type. And there's another one. What's this one? This one has an interesting color to it. Check that out. Looks like, I don't know if I would say that's an orange vigor or something. Um, the brown bugs, which look like mites. Um, they, they could be mites, and that's not uncommon in a new culture, too. Kind of like the mold thing. But if you put springtails in and you feed them minimally until they're reproducing well, you probably don't have to worry too much about the mites. Okay, so Zach Wallace. Yes, see what you're saying. Living with the the emperor scorpion you want to make sure they're not attacking the emperor scorpion in search of calcium that makes sense and we can totally see some milkbacks i did show some titans a minute ago but i can do the milkbacks anybody no. okay okay so we'll do some milkbacks um yeah, the egg eaters, the problem with egg eaters is you can't just feed them chicken eggs. You need to get like small quail eggs, finch eggs for the really small ones. And not just quail quail eggs, but like button quail eggs, caternix quail eggs, depending on the size of the uh, snake, that kind of stuff. So they need to stay very small, the eggs that you get. So if you're breeding finches, I used to breed finches and at the time I didn't have any snakes, but I... You know, that could have worked for me, I suppose, because they certainly produced a lot of eggs. Hmm. Okay. Did you ever get baby Spirostreptus species 1 from your individuals? Not yet. I don't think they're quite full grown yet. Hopefully we'll get some soon. I'm going to do a feeding thing here. These are so fun to watch feed. Um, these guys have a feeding response just like milk backs. So it's going to be really easy to get them feeding, and we can watch that for a little while as we chat. They'll go right for that food. If, there's, if there aren't isopods on that within one minute, I will be very surprised. In fact, I expect them sooner. And there's the first one right there. Okay. Rochant, hello and welcome. And... D'Angelo Hurtado. Well, that's, that's great to hear. I, I love to hear that. So I'm glad it has been helpful for you. Koki Bro, my dairy cows made hundreds, made babies and there's hundreds. They will do that. Definitely. 
Is anybody else seeing this just slightly out of focus, or how's it coming in for you? It's, uh, maybe I got my reading glasses on wrong or something. Or there's, maybe they're fuzzy, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. If that's me, or if it's the actual camera. Um, okay, let's see. I want to get Euromastics to the next lizard one. You'd like to use seed as a substrate, so don't want grain mites. Anyways, to prevent them. I'm thinking with, the, with Euromastics, it might be dry enough in there. You won't have to worry about it. Dry and hot enough. That's what I'm thinking. Do you, but I, I, you know, I haven't kept Euromastics, so I'm not entirely sure. But I have heard about keeping them on bird seed as a substrate. So do you think keeping magic potions with wild types will eventually breed out the magic potion, or are both phenotypes strong enough to coexist? I think it's kind of a numbers game. If you put, you know, three magic potions with 400 wild types, you might eventually see a whole lot of them. But fewer than even you might. Um, on how it's, there's some you know, chance involved there too, but because magic potion is recessive trait, as far as I'm aware, uh, you wouldn't see very many in proportion to the population. If you had equal numbers, you'd have you'd get a higher proportion. If you had like three wild types and 200 magic potions, you'd see most of the magic potions. Which Um, an armadillity in Bulgaria, I would say, go with Porcelli Levis if you want activity based on my Okay, just tried to turn the sound on. Let's see. Hmm. How's the sound now? Is that any better? Okay, I just had to uh, plug some more things in. Sorry, I'm so behind on the chat that I missed that for a while. But uh, okay. Okay, so anyway, the we were talking about the... What was the last thing I was talking about before the audio went out? I would say Porcelia Levis are definitely the choice if you want more activity. Um, and Heather Jensen's question is about milkbacks. I do have them inter... Well, no, I do... I can't say that I have them interbreeding. Just a second. What I mean to say is I have them cohabitating and there are offspring in the enclosure, but I'm just not sure where where it's going from there. So um, I have them right here. I'm going to attempt to show them to you just a second. See, now we've got more of the milk bags hanging out. And I'll leave them there to eat because I know I'm going to move them temporarily, but we'll bring them back because I want to see what they're doing in a minute. But I'd like to show the enclosure that Heather was inquiring about. And let's see, how is this? Oh, you found one, Muffin Man, you found a dairy cow. Okay, get prepared to look at this. This is what we got. You see how we've got some babies in there? The babies so far appear to be either orange or milk back. That doesn't necessarily prove anything at this point. There are more babies in there. There are lots of little babies. So we'll see what we see. Because there are both in here, it's very possible that um, the babies we're seeing are just... I mean, there are tons of babies in there. The, the focus is not helping. But I have not seen any babies that are clearly wild type yet. And that could change any day. I mean, it, it may turn out that these are just oranges and just milkbacks and we might find that we've got some crosses they're just too young too young to tell but as you can see there there are two very clearly orange babies there so uh, the experiment is underway 
just inconclusive so far. I am hoping we, we have some interesting information for you in the future, but nothing going on yet except for reproduction, nothing genetically conclusive, we put it that way. These guys are, are building up. Um, okay, so Space Monkey, which would be better for beginner, Powder Blues or Dalmatians? Um, it depends on what you want. I would say both of them are pretty cool. Dalmatians do lose, tend to lose pattern over the generation. So you get a few nice Dalmatians, put them together, and you're going to get almost pure white ones. And you'll get some that are nice Dalmatians. The powders are going to breed faster and move a lot more, be more active in the daytime. So there's that. So it kind of depends on what you're interested in. Albatross Gaming. Green snakes are not great pets. Don't necessarily do excellently in captivity. Um, but if they do, they're more display animals than anything else. Decay's brown snake, very few people keep them. I know Emily at Snake Discovery, Emily and Ed have some, and they seem to be doing really well. And they're, so I don't know, if I were going to pick, I don't know a lot about either one. I've researched both to some extent, but I would say if I were going to pick, I'd probably get Decay's brown snakes just because I know they're thriving for Emily and Ed on a supplemented worm and maybe slug diet. And that's pretty easy to do. Uh, the green snakes don't seem to do all that well for a lot of people. So, And Armadillidium vulgari, what do you think the minimum number of ice pods required to start a colony is? Well, I know of people who have done it with one. They get one female who has been fertilized because, you, you know, the female can be fertilized when she's quite young and remain fertile and produce several broods of young without being fertilized again. Uh, so uh, I would say you know, you can do it with that. I wouldn't recommend it, partly for issues of inbreeding depression, and partly because it just takes longer. I would say go with at least 10, like Frank to Tank says. If you can go with more, go with more. I'd say, you know, start with, if you can, start with 20, 30, 40, 50, and then that will help. And Ike dealt with grindleworms in isopod enclosures. Yes, I got a dwarfed, dwarf striped culture that had grindleworms in it. And didn't turn out to be a problem uh, they just eventually, I think the isopods outcompeted them. That's what happened. It's been a while, but I, I agree that's what, I mean, I, I believe that's what happened. And... Ashley started with Dalmatians and powders, and you have hundreds of powders. Yeah, they, they're they hard to stop. I wouldn't keep Armadillidium vulgari and Porcelli Levis together because I think the Levis would outcompete the Armadillidium vulgari after not too long. Matt M., hello. And Space Monkey, would I be able to crossbreed Porcelli Levis, Gaber, Orange, and Dalmatians? I did it. I was not the first to do it, but that's where Orange Dalmatians came from, from that cross. Ryan Orr was the name of the original breeder, if I recall correctly. He had some orange that he had isolated from a single individual that he found in his yard under a flower pot, if I'm recalling correctly. And he crossed them with Dalmatians. And the first generation was mostly wild types. And then he crossed the wild types to the wild types. And some of the babies resulted in being orange Dalmatians. I decided to do the same thing, and I did. And so, yes, it works. So official fire mage, preference on feeding schedule, uh, they're pretty voracious isopods. So I would say make sure that you never run out of leaves and feed them at least, very least twice a week, but probably more. Just make sure that they're eating the food or nearly finishing the food by the time you feed them again. And the water partly depends on the ventilation and the temperature and so on where you are. But if you have a mossy spot like mine and you, you moisten it uh, once a week, it's probably going to be enough unless your ventilation is really in intense, and then maybe twice a week. And Ike, oh, you catch the grindleworms and feed them to the guppies. Why not? That's a good way to do it. Okay, moss paws, be concerned about breeding in your colony. How did we get koi scabers? I think that was Alan Gross. 
um, from the same experiment. He was working with, he was trying to produce orange Dalmatians as well, and I think some koi popped up in there uh, because there were other genes going on too. So I think that's what's happening. Uh, I think that's what happened if I remember because I was following it on uh, Dendroboard at the time when he was talking about it, but it's been a while so I, I could have that wrong. So Amelia, the person, what does their poop look like? I actually showed some when I was showing um, Titans or Porcelio Hoffman's egg guy. Isopod poop looks, in general, let me see if I can show you some. Uh, there's some flecks of it on this wood, it's kind of hard to point out. They're kind of like rectangular flat, vaguely rectangular flat pieces of substrate. Kind of like that. Um, Day protein also my ventilation is one. I have a lot of holes and the other have very little. So official fire mage, maybe one side has a lot of holes and one has very little. That sounds like a pretty good regimen to me. Space monkey, I do give my isopods some pecan leaves. I happen to have two pecan trees, so I give them those and they seem to eat them just fine. Do powders have a high humidity need? I'm problems keeping high humidity in the terrarium. I'm looking to fixing that, but I hate to lose any over humidity drop. Powders actually are fine if much of the enclosure is fairly dry. I keep powders in my leopard gecko enclosure with a very, very ventilated, well-ventilated top. You know, it's just a, a mesh top. And they do fine in there. They do need a hydration station always. So make sure to provide that. But as long as you provide a hydration station, uh, like a mossy spot like this one that I have here, they should do fine in there. Totally fine. In fact, I find that uh, when I tried to keep um, powder blues in with my dart frogs, it was too humid and too wet, too uh, poorly ventilated, and they did not do well. And Matt M, they are eating something. I put a couple of fish food pellets in there. That's what they're going after. Hello, Nicholas. Rochant, what leaves can we not give our isopods? Well, that is a good question. There's going to be some debate over that. There are some leaves that have toxins in them that are bad for millipedes, or isopods, probably millipedes as well. Um, I just saw a millipede in, out of the corner of my eye, and that's why I said that. Um, so those leaves, though, when they fall off the tree naturally and die and dry, they often, a lot of those toxins are uh, done away with. And so, for example, walnut leaves uh, have toxins in them, but when they dry and die, they do okay. I feed mine walnut leaves from our walnut trees, and it seems to work just fine. So, um, yeah, they, it uh, it's hard to say. I would... Avoid anything that's known to be highly toxic. I avoid cherry leaves, for example. I'm not sure if that's an issue or not, but I don't use them. Oh, Tip Top Taylor. Yeah, basically, I think it depends on the proportions you start with. If you have a really high proportion of magic potions, you'll probably still keep them. If there's a really low proportion, you probably won't, basically. So, Ike. Oh, yeah, the Grindelworms are one of the best feeders, in my opinion, for fish, uh, like in terms of wormy things you can culture terrestrially. I think they're great fish food. I haven't put leaves, but I put orange fruit leaves. So, um, you know, I haven't tried orange fruit leaves, but uh, I don't know. If if you, they're dry when you put them in, you could try it and see how it goes. Is it like on a trial basis, small quantities. Charcoal in the container is good. I do that too. And Nicholas, yes, I do remember you. So Heather Jensen. Oh, yes, you have more potions in there than anything. That's really interesting. I remember you were talking about isolating them out. But that's interesting you have so many. So Armadillidium vulgaria. Oak or maple leaves toxic to isopods. Those are some of the best leaves to use. At least the oak are some of the best. Maple are good as an ingredient. I use both. And Nicholas, I do appreciate that you watched the videos. And thank you, Wally, for joining in. I'm sorry you got to go, but I appreciate everything. And official fire mage, I would avoid using leaves that were cut. Chemically, they're going to be different. Nutritionally, they're going to be different. So Albatross Gaming, I have bred a couple of different types of crickets. Um, and the one I'm working with now is the banded cricket. Griloides sigillatus, as opposed to the Aceta domestica, the house cricket. I've done both. I prefer banded crickets in all ways but one. They, they have a longer lifespan. They're quieter. Uh, they stink less. They die off less. They, uh, they do great, but one problem is they hop better. 
So they're better at escaping when you open the container. So snail entologists, soil centipedes, like the um, geophilomorpha centipedes, I occasionally find them. I have not uh, tried to keep any, so I don't know a lot about them otherwise uh, than the fact that geophilomorpha are the ones with the incredibly long bodies, thin bodies, many, many legs, and some of them at least are omnivorous, but some of the uh, scolopendromorphs are also uh, omnivorous. So. So I think, Ashley, if you keep your Volgari T-plus albinos and your magic potion, you're going to get some of both, and you'll keep getting some of both. And you'll probably also get some that would be magic potions, but the little spots on them are just the albino coloration and might not show up as much. Much. Hello, Jetsers Aquariums. Welcome. Um, if it has pesticides, uh, some pesticides might be neutralized by boiling baking, but I'm not sure. I would try to avoid that. Just pesticides in general. Huh, very interesting, Heather, that that worked out that way. So, Brian, are the aspen and poplar working for you? I've used cottonwood, and I've used... I don't know if I've used aspen leaves. I've used aspen wood. So, isopods don't like ginkgo, huh? Interesting. Ike, so your mini phalaenopsis. Mm, interesting. That's cool that they... Uh, they're eating the orchid leaves. I've I've tried quite a few different leaves. Huh. You have the ginkgo as a houseplant, that'd be something. Good ID guide for North American millipede species. I'd just go to Bug Guide or or iNaturalist or both. So Arbitros Gaming, your Avulgari are eating lime leaves. That's cool. So, do I need a different container or keep it in one container because I have a feeling ice pods would die off if it inbreeds? Meaning, you want different containers of ice pods to keep uh, robust populations with large numbers so that you don't have inbreeding? Okay, Space Monkey. Let's see if we can get some duckies. One thing when I'm doing this, I don't like to handle the dwarf white so much because then I have to sanitize my hands in between to keep uh, problems from occurring because you can easily cause an infestation that way if you know what I mean the uh, dwarf whites get everywhere okay this is the the ducky enclosure this is in the uh, Tarantula cribs, one of the tarantula cribs enclosures. I'm gonna see if we can see any here. Well, there's a little bit of mold going on in there. That's no good. I have to get that piece of food out. There is one of the larger duckies in the in the rock there. The limestone. Kind of entrenched in there. I'm gonna dig out that piece of food and see if there's any, uh, if I can. I think that was too much food for this side of enclosure. Uh, I got some smaller fish food pellets because I ordered some and they were too big. So now I'm going to use the smaller pellets for these smaller enclosures like this one. Oh, there's some little duckies right there running around. Oh, don't want to lose that moss. Could have duckies on it. They didn't stay very long, did they? <laughs> Sorry, they're pretty secretive in there. Um, let's see if there's anybody down there. Oh, I can see some duckies down at the bottom, but I don't know if you can see them. A uh, little bit difficult to see in here because they're hiding, but Hopefully you had a chance to spot them a little bit. I actually am thinking, oh, did I put that in it upside down? No, nope, no, nope, I was good. There, okay. I'm gonna get uh, another enclosure. We're gonna take a look at the uh, powder blues. Not the powder blues. 
sorry. The Oreo crumbles. Same species as powder blues. But they're not powder blues. They are Oreo crumbles. Another tarantula cribs enclosures. I'm loving these, by the way. Thanks to tarantula cribs for sending me these. They are fantastic enclosures. They have excellent display quality and they uh, have excellent ventilation. Okay. Oh, well, thank you. We we passed 47 likes. We hit 47 likes. That's awesome. Conifer wood, it depends on who you talk to, but it's probably not the best item before him, but I've seen them eat it. Ooh, oh, we got babies everywhere running around. Sorry, I don't know how much of that was on camera when I picked it up. I saw them running around and I didn't want them to scatter everywhere in like out of the enclosure, so I put the wood down. I don't know if you missed that or not. Let's lift up this piece and see what we got here. Hopefully... Well, there's quite a few there, but not as many babies under this piece. But these Oreo crumbles are fantastic. Really like them. And I'm glad they're breeding for me now. So. Rubber duckies were a little tricky for me to breed. They took forever, but they eventually did it. And I don't feel like it's so much that they're hard to breed. It's just dialing into their husbandry. They like it really moist. They don't need a lot of ventilation. They like uh, some fishy food, like they like fish food flakes or fish food pellets. They like it fairly moderately temperature. They don't like it too warm, but they don't like it cold either. So in like the mid 70s, it uh, seems to be a good, good uh, range for them. And they do quite well at that temperature. I'm going to try to grab something else here. Wow, it looks like we might actually get to 60 likes. That's cool. That might be a new record. We're going to look at the Porcellione de Sprinosis Whiteout and see how they're looking. We um, recently redid the substrate in here. I'm going to see how they're doing. So Oreo crumbles are pretty fast breeders because all the Porcellione de Sprinosis, they're all pretty fast breeders. So we're almost there. 58 likes is what I'm seeing on my screen. But it could have gone farther than that. I don't know. Further than that. Um, so Rebecca, seven-year-old niece, wants to raise some isopods. I would say Armadillidium vulgari is a good one to go with. Here's some, some white out. This is Porcellionides prenosis again. They're very fast. Oh, we hit 60 likes on my side. That's a really good one to go with. The dairy cows are great, too. Um, they're faster moving, so if she cares about handling them, the... Um, Armadillidium vulgari might be a better one. And uh, zebra isopods are another great one to do for a, a seven-year-old, I would say. Um, so, yeah, if she wants fancy ones, zebras. Do zebras or get a fancy type of Armadillidium vulgari, like a gem mix or orange vigor or something like that. And... Wow, we're getting some good likes on this one, guys. I appreciate it. Guys, gals, everyone. I shouldn't say words like guys that are not all inclusive, so I'm just going to say everyone. Um, really appreciate that. Look at these. They're doing well on that piece of magnolia pod. Um, so, Heather, I have seen the Marulanella tricolor. They look fantastic. And someday I hope to get some. They're not on my permit at the time. I can't even get them sent to me, but I'm hoping to change that in the future. So that would be something. They are fantastic looking ice pods. They really are. I had somebody send a picture of them to me, text a picture and say, look at these. I don't know what they are, but I need them or something like that. It was pretty funny. But I'm, I am liking these, uh, the whiteouts. I've had these not as long as my oranges and not as long as my powder blues, but I've had them longer than my Oreo crumbles. Zero cool. Identify as the zebra isopod. That's awesome. Yeah, you got good taste. So we do have about five more minutes left, approximately. 
Um, I'm going to pull out the Punta Canas because I love them. They're one of my favorite Armadillidium vulgari morphs, but I have a lot of favorite Armadillidium vulgari morphs. And then uh, maybe we'll do one or two more. And here we go. So tricolor are active all day. That's good to know. I didn't know that. I love it. I love the active ones. Here's my... Uh, these are my Armadillidium vulgaria punticana. So a good Rebecca, this would be a good one to get because they're kind of fancy. Um, they got some variety to them. So my leaves I collect in my backyard and I do sell them for people who are interested. As long as you're in the US, I can ship them. I have to sanitize them first, but then I'm allowed to ship them. Um, Albatross gaming, care keeping and breeding of web spinners. That sounds familiar to me, but I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. So I'd like to know more. Can you mix crumbles with others to get spotting of colors? Has anyone done that? I've heard of people trying it. I think it works. There shouldn't be any obstacles to doing it. So my plan is to when I get enough of the Oreo crumbles, I'm going to put them with oranges and see if we can get orange crumbles. And then I'll put the orange crumbles with another variety and, you know, keep going. See if we can get a really cool gem mix going as well as just keeping some isolated orange crumbles. So polar tea, I'm not sure what the genetics are behind uh, Punta Cana's, but I know people put Punta Cana's in gem mixes and it works just fine. So you'd probably get, uh, it, assuming it's single gene recessive, you get Punta Cana's plus wild types and you just have a higher proportion of wild types. Probably. Live plant with isopods. In bioactive enclosures, it works for me, but um, I haven't tried in just isopod specific enclosures. And white tigers, I don't have those uh, at this time. Oh, could we hit 100 likes? That would be awesome. I don't know if we have enough people in here to do that, though. Deep gray without gold flex is so underrated. You know, it is. And that's, that's one reason why I like Punta Cana so much, is you get all these kind of metallic tones, but then you get just like the pure gray, which they stand out really nicely against each other. And so I totally get what you're saying. With... You get the sort of coppery look, and then you get the, the slate gray look, and I like it. Um, let's see, have I shown any Porcellus Cabers yet? No, uh, not today, I don't think so. So Albatross Gaming, I'm going to have to look that up, because those sound interesting. And Elliot Park. As long as you're in the U.S. and you're not in Florida or Hawaii, which are the two states I cannot currently send to, I can send to Washington, D.C., even though it's uh, not a state, um, then yes, uh, I can ship to you. But you can go to my website, aquariumx.com. You can also go to isopodsrs.com. And they will get you there. That will get you there to my website. Uh, and you can buy from me. I have a, a stock list and you check out the stock list and then you send me an email and tell me what you want and I'll get you a, a link, a payment link. Um, and hopefully that helps. Thank you, Heather, for throwing that up on the, the link up on there. Appreciate that. And so Albatross Gaming, do you have any videos of this stuff, of the web spinners? This sounds pretty cool. I'm excited about this idea. And yeah, um, that makes sense, Heather, that you have to uh, you have to feed them. So Rebecca, hopefully that helps. Yes, aquarimax.com where Heather put that link up. That's where you can buy these guys. This would be another actually good option for you, um, Rebecca. If you want something colorful, you could do a Porcelio Scaber lottery mix like this. And these are actually the descendants of the f when I first started making um, orange Dalmatians. So they've got normal Dalmatians, calico Dalmatians, normals, oranges, calicos, um, all different kinds of colors in here. They've got some, I think we have some whiteouts in here too. And there's a few pides, or I think there are some pides in here as well. So lots of different ones and they're fun. So that would be another option. Yep. 
So AquariumMix.com or IsopodsRUs.com. Uh, either one will get you to my website where my, uh, my, what do you call, my stock list of items that I am selling. Cool. Well, in a second here, I'm going to have to go. <laughs> you wish you had a Canadian Russ. That's awesome. Someday I hope to be able to ship to Canada, but for now I can't. But because uh, a lot of these isopods are established in Canada, maybe one day that will be possible. So Andrew Sorrentino, that's a great question. I have not tried that before an enclosure is broken in. I've only added it to established enclosures. Um, hmm. That's interesting, Albatross Gaming, these web spinners. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Um, I can do until 65 minutes, and we'll see if we can get some more likes in that time. That's as far as I can go, because I've got to go pretty soon, but I'm excited about how many likes we have. I'm excited about how many viewers we have. Um... I, I'm really interested to see how the dairy cows would do with a big skeleton item like that. Um, I do remember, I believe, Heather, you said you put, um, was it a rodent skeleton with dairy cows? And they, they cleaned it up and then started gnawing on it. Whoa, that one needs some more moss, this, this colony. This is living proof, living proof that isopods will eat cork bark. This piece has been really decimated by the Silisticus convexus. And they've been in here for a number of years. I collected about a dozen of them in my backyard, just out back here. And thank you, Rochant. Um, so they've, they've probably been in here, I don't know, probably four or five years. And they are definitely making a dent in this cork bark. So kind of fun to see. Uh, so living life produced just right after two months of acquiring used your bridges for a starting point made a few tweaks though also produced rubber duckies after three months nice that is hats off to you that's that's pretty awesome took me longer with rubber duckies and just Roy, i got mine as tiny babies but it did take me a while too but as soon as they got to adult sizes when they started producing that's awesome and rebecca well i'm, I'm happy to help you out send me an email um, winter shipping is going to go into effect soon, but I think we've got a few more weeks before we have to shut down shipping. Um, I do ship with styrofoam lined containers, and that helps, as long as the temperature is not too bad. So, hopefully that helps. Best places to find wild isopods? Basically, under rocks, under flat, under flat rocks, under pieces of wood, in moist leaf litter areas, anywhere where there's some moisture building up and some organic material. Uh, yeah, if it's, they've got some moisture there and it's dark and protected. So, and yeah, Rebecca, sorry. Um, sometimes I forget about the Latin names that I should uh, also use common names. These are sometimes called the curly isopod or the teardrop isopod here. Um, whoa, that is really cool, Albatross Gaming. And mass parakeet is back. Nice. So these are kind of an underrated cleaner isopod. They thrive really well. They don't care a whole lot about how much ventilation they get. They can handle moist uh, areas and they can handle drier. I'm trying them in with a crested gecko. I have had them in there for a number of months as a cleanup crew and they seem to do just fine. So maybe we will finish up. No, not maybe. We will finish up with... Porcelio Hornatus, yellow dot, is there an intense species uh, in terms of activity levels and just sheer numbers. I've got lots of them. These don't really have a common name. They just call them yellow dots or sometimes call them south or dark south or gold dot. Uh, I, I have done that in herping videos, including invertebrates. So yeah, not isopods specifically, but I have done that. I need to do it again. And Rodolfo, you have the black ones. Nice. In the wild video where Russ IDs things in his backyard. 
Oh, maybe I need to do that. Maybe I need to do that. I'll definitely need to do some more uh, trips where I go out and find things in the wild and talk about them. I like doing those videos. I've done them for the past couple of years, two or three years I've done them, but it's uh, been a while. Tangerine version of Ornatus. Okay. I've got the high yellows and I've got this one, the yellow dots, and that's it. Has anyone selected for gray or brown morphs and yellow dots? Hmm. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? I don't know if anybody's done that. Okay. Well, it's a, it's a good idea there uh, to maybe something to pursue. So we've got it up to 73 likes, which is pretty awesome. Finishing out with 46 watchers. It's a pretty good live stream, I would say. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Up to 74 likes. 75. It's going well. Thank you, everyone. And I'm going to go make another video for you so you can watch it uh, coming up. I have a, the video that's coming up on Friday is already filmed and uh, uploaded. It's just ready to go. I'm excited about that one, too. And I've got some really fun products coming up. I have some projects coming up in my videos. So uh, keep your eyes open for that. And... See you all soon.